epistle, the whole saints day is taken from the book of Apocalypse, chapter 7. In those days, behold, I, John, saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, who had it in their power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God upon their foreheads. And heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 signed, out of every tribe of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 signed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser, 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephtali, 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. Of the tribe of Zabulon, 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 signed. After this I saw a great multitude which no man could number, out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing round about the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory, and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then the Gospel. King of the God, according to St. Matthew, chapter 5. At that time, Jesus, seeing the crowds, went up the mountain. When he was seated, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the earth. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they should be called the children of God. Blessed are they who suffer persecution for justice's sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men reproach you and persecute you, and speaking falsely say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and exult, because your reward is great in heaven. Thus for the words of today's holy gospel. <coughs> Amen. We're doing today this feast of uh, all saints. Originally, the name of this feast, the feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints. It is one of the feasts of Our Lady. And remember that one of the mysteries of eternal salvation is that no man goes to heaven without the Blessed Virgin Mary. There is no saint without her. There is no happiness, no peace, no coming of Christ, no truth. Nothing good comes to this world without her. And so this Feast of All the Saints is the Feast of Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints. And we're reminded that our Lord more than made up for the terrible sin of Eve. Remember the very beginning of time when God created man and made him into his image and likeness. He said, let us make man according to our own image and likeness. And so he did make man according to his own image and likeness. And he made him most wonderful. He made man magnificent, making Adam perfect, making Eve perfect from the side of Adam. But then Eve, of course, she decided to commit the original sin, or the first part of it. And she decided to bring maliciousness into the world. She brought maliciousness into the world. St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that Saint uh, that Adam's, Adam is a saint. If he, of course, is a saint. He is now in the kingdom of heaven. But Adam's sin was greater than Eve's because he was the head of the universe. He was the head of the world. He was the king. He was the first pope, the first bishop, the first priest, the first king, the first source of all humanity. So therefore his sin was worse than Eve's because of his position. But as to maliciousness, her sin was greater. She's the one that motivated the sin. Satan spoke with her, and because of it, she decided that she would outsmart Satan, which of course she could not do, when she had an argument with Satan, she lost the argument. And then she ate the forbidden fruit. And once she ate the forbidden fruit, she was driven by a power, driven by a fire. 
that that which was in her was going to be in Adam. That which was in her would also be passed on to her children. She had a drive. This drive would be called, in her children, the inclination to sin. She was the first one to have that inclination. Darkening of the intellect, weakening of the will, and a strong inclination to evil. Where does this come from? It's true that, strictly speaking, it comes from Adam because he committed the original sin. But in fact, all the motivation of wickedness, all that motivation comes from Eve. So that she was the one who had that motivation in her spirit. She was motivated. And she went to Adam and she was going to not let Adam rest until Adam ate that fruit. And so Adam, who would not have eaten the fruit, the forbidden fruit, unless it was given to him by Eve, this original sin would not have happened. And so there became a great mark upon, upon womanhood, a great mark upon the, the, the female of the, of the human species because of the great terrible thing that she did. She motivated Adam to sin, a great maliciousness. She brought about darkening of the intellect. She brought about weakening of the will. She brought about an inclination to evil and passed it on to her children, even though her husband, Adam, would be more responsible, more guilty, strictly speaking. But as to the maliciousness, it was her. As a motivating force, it was her. Hence, God the Son and the healing of the human race. He was not simply going to come down and fix the problem by giving us a new Adam who would be the new king to replace the old one and the new man to replace the first man and make a more wonderful Christ who would replace the first Adam. He couldn't complete his work of, of changing this world, making man fully healed, unless he made Mary. As St. Bernard says, she is Ave. She is the one that we say simply Ave Maria. Eva is the name of the first woman that was created by God, and the exact opposite of her is created in, in Eve, in, in, in Ave, in, in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Eva, the first woman, the opposite Ave, the Blessed Virgin Mary. But what is it? How did sin come to us? We are all affected by women. And it is a fact that whenever there's an evil deed done in the world, there's a girl behind it somewhere. And this is a fact of history. Whenever there's an evil deed, there's a woman behind it. First the evil deed, Eve was there. And every evil deed since then, there is some woman behind it. And they are powerful and motivating to evil. Therefore, God, in healing the human race, what did he have to do? What did he choose to do? He decided to give a special power to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And by this, a special power to those women that imitate her to be able to change the world. <coughs> One of the great powers of Eve that Satan recognized in her right away, she has the power to move Adam. She has the power to change Adam. She has the power to get Adam to do things that he would otherwise not do. And remember, what Adam could not be experienced could not experience any temptation of the flesh. He couldn't even experience his temptation, so she could not seduce him. She was given a power over his will, a power over his mind, a power over his heart, a power over his whole being. She had a power to motivate him, a power to move him, a power to get him to do things that he could not, but would otherwise never do. This power God gave to Eve. So then she commits, he commits the original sin. When God fixes... He fixes things perfectly. And as we find in the New Testament, no good deed, either of the saints of the Old Testament or of the New, is ever done without a woman. It is one of the mysteries of the Catholic faith, for instance, that we find Catholics, wherever they work, even when we find the great saints, like St. John Bosco, or even St. Pius X, when we streak behind them, or St. Francis of Assisi, look behind them and you will always find a woman somewhere. And the woman that is the one that makes possible for holy things to happen in the Catholic Church and holy things to happen in the world is the Blessed Virgin Mary. There are no saints without her. There is no goodness without her. When God decided to fix the problem of sin, he chose to fix it through her. And remember Eve, though we know her most especially as that woman who brought us sin in the world. But what did she do for 900 years? Which began, remember the church tells us, Oh, look at the holy women of the Old Testament. Each of them tells us something about the beauty and the power of Mary. Each of us tells us a little something about the Blessed Virgin Mary. And the first holy woman of the Old Testament was Eve. We know that Eve, of course, was responsible for <coughs> bringing about the original sin. 
<coughs> but then what happened? <coughs> the devil was spoken to in the presence of Eve. And Eve was in an absolute state of total discouragement, and perhaps the point of total despair, heard God speak to that serpent. Because remember, he condemned the serpent first, and then he condemned Eve second, and then he condemned Adam third. And when he condemned the serpent, St. Augustine points out how Christ spoke violently to the serpent. And in his speaking to the serpent, he softened what he would say to Eve, and he softened what he would say to Adam. Because Eve well, should expect, if he's going to smash the serpent, who's just a snake and just representative, what's he going to do to me? And they were in total terror at the justice of God. And justice of God looked firstly at the snake. And he said, I will make you writhe upon the ground, and I will destroy you. But then what did he say? Oh, but enmity is between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush the head. And when Eve heard these words, hope rose up inside of her because she knew she must be punished. Of course she must be punished because of her terrible sin. And hope rose up in front of Adam also because the seed would have to come through her. The seed would have to come through Adam, from Adam through her. And therefore, that the seed of her child, her children are going to be born in death. Her children are going to be born doomed to eternal damnation. But God speaks to the serpent and says, You snake, you Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. All saints, everyone that goes to heaven, is a warrior against the snake. A warrior against the serpent, a warrior against Satan, and, he, and, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed, which is lies, thy seed, which is sin, thy seed, which is all manner of wickedness, and her seed, which is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. From here we get all the theology of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all that we need and the, and the first hope and the only hope for all humanity. From the very, very beginning, Eve was going to be nailed. She was going to be attacked. She was going to be punished seriously by God. But just before punishing her, seeing the terror of Eve as she trembled in fear before the justice of God, he mitigates his, his punishment. This is the way of Christ, says say the saints. He's going to punish he is going very angry. He is going to punish. He is going to smash. He is going to destroy. And by the time he shows up, he forgets his punishment. He diminishes his punishment. And he doesn't destroy, but he brings a blessing. This is the way of Christ. Remember that Jonas complained about that. He mentioned many times. Jonas complained. He said, you're telling me to tell the Ninevites that they're going to be destroyed. But I know you, God. I know you're going to change your mind. And I know you're not going to destroy them. Where did this come from? What's the first time this happens in history? When our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, the Son of the Holy Ghost, the three persons of the Trinity, speak to that serpent. When they speak to that serpent and say, I'll put enmity between thee, between thee and the woman. And when she heard the word, the woman, she had hope. The only hope of Eve from the very first moment was that woman. And when Adam heard the word, he was filled with hope also, for the woman came from his side. And when they heard the word of God speaking angrily to the serpent with the most terrible justice, they heard the word woman and the woman, and hope rose up in the entirety of the human race. And there has never been hope outside of that woman, and there will never be hope outside of that woman. And there will never be a fight against the enemy, enemy, against Satan, which can be won on even the smallest level without that woman. And that's what it says right there in Genesis chapter 3, against the wicked belief of the Protestants and the wicked belief of all those who diminish the Holy Mother. And therefore it did. It's God himself who said from the very beginning, no saints, no victory, no faith, no conquering of the devil, no hope unless this woman comes. And there was a great hope given to all humanity. And the hope remains to this day. And there's a special hatred of that woman. Now the hatred of that woman, of course, is always in hell. But we notice in our times, we're getting down to the essential fight of Satan against Christ. 
We're getting down to the absolute essential fight. We're pulling out the absolutely essential weapons. We're in the last part of the great battle. And in the last part of the great battle, we're fighting the essential things. And it's foolish just to say the last part of the fight, as some have said, in the quoting of the false Lucy, that the last battle is the battle of the family. That's not the last battle. The last battle is the fighting against the Antichrist, directly against Christ. The divinity of God against the false lies of Satan who will try to make himself God. And it's going to be a direct fight of God against a false God. Against the true divine religion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Against the false religion of Satan. And how is it, how did God come into this world? And how did he stay in this world? Only through the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Only through her. So at the very beginning, we have Eve. And Eve was filled with hope. And she lived 930 more years. What did she do in those 930 years? She wept and she did penance. The first thing she did was weep. And the very first thing the holy woman must do is to do what Eve did. She wept. Remember that Eve knew that all her children would not die, that her children would be born perfect, that they would not grow old, that they would not have the imperfections of impurity or any kind of sins of the flesh. They would not know the crimes of passion. But because of her sin, passion would fill the world, and sin would fill the world, and all of her children would die, and she would see her first son, not, not, not Cain, but Abel, dead before her. And then she would see how many hundreds of thousands of her children die in the next 900 years. All of those people that died, they were her children. And she wept over 900 years. And she's the first great penitent. And the first thing the Blessed Virgin Mary does in the making of saints is she weeps. The first thing that she is is the mother of sorrows. Because she recognizes that these children that God the Son gave to her as her children on the cross. Woman, behold thy son. Who are these sons that our Lord Jesus Christ gave to her? They are born the enemies of God, each one of us. We were born sinners and the enemies of God, and she gave was given to us as a, she, we were given to her as her children, as her children by our Lord Jesus Christ. And what is the first thing she does when she looks at us? She must weep. She's the mother of sorrows, and we see the great sorrow of the Blessed Virgin Mary in Eve, who spent nine hundred years weeping, nine hundred years. And then we find the wife of Noah who made sure that all things were taken care of inside the ark, of all those, the food that was provided in the ark, the survival inside of the ark, the encouragement of the, the, of the seven others inside of the ark came from her. And so those who are going to survive inside of the church are going to have to be with Mary. And we go down further, and we see the great women of the Old Testament, each of them showing forth the power of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There's no possibility of achieving happiness, and there's no sanctity, there's no peace, there's no conquering of the Satan without her. And hence this feast was always called in the early days the Feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the saints. There are there two. And all the saints. How can there be saints? There is no sanctity. There's no greatness of Thomas Aquinas. There's no greatness of Augustine. There's no greatness of John Bosco or any of the other saints. There's no greatness of any of them without her. Everything comes through her. She is the one who motivates all goodness. Remember that Eve brought in the darkening of the intellect. Eve brought in the weakening of the will. And she brought in the strong inclination to evil. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, when she enters our hearts, St. Louis de Montfort says, she must enter our hearts. Everyone says they love Mary because we know that she is our mother. But we don't love her. She's not in our hearts. But when she enters the heart, what happens? These three things are taken away. The darkness of the intellect is replaced with light. Do you want to not be a heretic? Do you want to not be deceived? Do you want to be able to overcome the deceits of the devil and the lies that the Lord Jesus Christ warned about in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 24 in our times? He said, they will deceive, if possible, even the elect. There will be many false Christs. There will be many liars, many heresies, many deceivers, and some of them will look so very holy. How can we decipher which one is which? Go to Mary. She is the one. Love the Blessed Virgin Mary with all our hearts. Say the rosary with a true devotion of the heart. Find that there's nothing, there's no answer to any trouble that, cannot, that doesn't come through her. 
and live inside of the Blessed Virgin. And then somehow darkness will be dispelled from the mind. There is no saint, none of them, who have ever, ever understood a truth without her. I hope an enmity between thee and the woman. What is his first enmity? He is called the father of lies. And what is the first enmity? It is the truth. The truth is the first enmity against the lies. And therefore, he is the father of lies, that is, Satan. Therefore, she is the mother of the truth. And she wipes out lies. She dispels darkness. And then there's the weakness of the will. Remember Deborah. Deborah was told the, the, the man, whatever his name is, go into battle and fight as a judge. And he says, I can't fight without you. You want a woman to be with you in the battle? Well, I don't care. Just you've got to be there. you got to be there. You've got to be there. And so she was. And without Deborah's presence, he could not win. And then how many times were, the, were the, the enemies of God defeated by a woman? How many times? The spike driven to the, the head of the one king. The, the great victory of Judith. Destroying Hall of Herodes. And where did David get his greatness? What made David above all the others? What is it that gave David such a great heart by which he gave us the Psalms? What made him the greatest of the Old Testament? It's the fact that he was the great grandson of Ruth and the great, I mean, the great grandson of Rahab and the grandson of Ruth. This, these were his grandmother and great grandmother, Ruth and Rahab, and they, they were the ones. Rahab saved the entire of the people of, of those who survived in Jericho only survived because of her. And Ruth gave up all things to follow the God of Naomi and to come to the true faith. She gave up all hope. And they had greatness in their hearts. And that heart, in their hearts, the heart of Rahab and the heart of Ruth entered into David. And hence, the Psalms of David are filled with the holy woman Ruth. And they are filled with the holy woman Rahab. They are filled with Mary. No man can have a great thought in his heart. No man can have a great desire. No man can have a great love. No man can have strength. No man can have power without her. It's not possible. Darkness of the intellect is wiped away by her, by the Blessed Virgin Mary. And those great saints would be called the fathers of the church. Those great saints had preached the divine truth. Where did they get their strength from? St. Thomas Aquinas as has said, as many other great fathers of the church, their strength came from the tabernacle. What is the tabernacle? Even many have noticed there's something sacred about the tabernacle. You know, that is the most wonderful thing when our Lord Jesus Christ is brought out in benediction. It is a most wonderful thing. We take our Lord Jesus Christ out of the tabernacle and we put him inside a monstrance and place him on high. But there's something more sacred about him being hidden behind the veils. There's something more wonderful about him being inside the tabernacle. Because somehow there we can see him better. When he's placed on top of a monstrance, and he's in the visibility of the host, we have to double genuflect and bow our heads. We have to stand during the office of Compline. We have to somehow be more respectful. We find it hard to stay awake. And we, yet we adore and we love. But there's something about Christ in the tabernacle. There is where he inspires the heart. There is where strength and wisdom comes from. Because without the tabernacle, what is that sacred tabernacle? The tabernacle is the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is the home of the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph. And when you look inside of that home, there Christ dwells. Who understands him? Who is the one that knows him best? She who holds him in her arms. The tabernacle is our Lord, Blessed Virgin Mary, holding Christ in her arms. The tabernacle is the Blessed Virgin Mary holding Christ in inside of her womb. It is the holy home in which Christ is found. And somehow we walk by that house. And we look into that house. We know Christ better. We human beings don't learn so easily by direct contact, by direct feeling of Christ, by direct looking at Christ. We need the hand of a Father. When you come to Holy Communion, it's the hand of the Father that praises the host upon your tongue. And the same is true for us priests. We get sick and go to the hospital, and we are dying. We don't touch our Lord Jesus Christ with our hands, and we are priests of God. Another priest comes in as our own father, and he takes the host and places it upon our tongues. We receive his children, and somehow this is the viaticum. 
I cannot give myself viaticum. I cannot give myself viaticum. Another priest must give me viaticum. If I am dying, and another priest can come and give me viaticum, the Holy Communion of viaticum, but I can't give it to myself. And so there's something about receiving from another, something about the hand of another. This is where strength comes from. This is where wisdom comes from. The tabernacle has changed the world. In the Old Testament, even look at the, this is one of the truths of the Old Testament. One of the truths carried forth in the New Testament. No one could enter the tabernacle of the Old Testament. But all the Jews received their strength from that tabernacle. They never entered. Inside that tabernacle was the presence of God. And the high priest himself could not enter. He only entered once a year inside of that tabernacle. Once a year he could go in. And they tied a rope to his leg in case he died. If he died in the tabernacle, they pulled him out. They tied bells to his leg so that they could tell him walking around within the tabernacle because they couldn't see him. And if they didn't hear the bells for a long time, they pulled him out with a rope. But they did not enter. He did not enter. No one enters the sacred tabernacle. This is Christ's home. Where is the darkening of intellect taken away? The Father is telling the church, the church breviary tells us, St. Thomas got his great wisdom from that tabernacle. It's the Blessed Virgin Mary. And where does strength of the will come from? It comes from that tabernacle. That's why it's so important when we say to the young, young seminarians to develop the habit. It's a necessary habit. It is not an option. There must be one hour of continuous presence in front of the Blessed Sacrament every day from the day of the beginning of the priesthood to the minimum until the day of death. And there can be no exceptions, as in zero, none. This is the place where priesthood is, where a priest learns his priesthood. Where, how does he learn it? In the presence of Christ, under the veils of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She's always there. There is no understanding of the Blessed Sacrament without that sacred tabernacle. And so the tabernacle of the Blessed Virgin Mary takes away the darkness that we receive light, takes away weakness that we become strength. And the strong inclination to evil is removed by a power that St. Pa Saint Augustine, or rather St. Paul speaks about. He says, Caritas Christi urgetnos. The chariot of Christ urges us. The chariot of Christ pushes us on. We find the saints driven by a force beyond their control. They're driven by a power that is not from them. This is the strong inclination to good. The strong inclination to carry Christ where he is not. The strong inclination to drive the devil out wherever the devil is. Strong inclination to establish the mystical body of Christ and his great power, to prepare souls for the, for, the, for the coming of heaven. This is an inclination. The saints are those whose darkness of intellect is taken away by light, whose weakness of the will is taken away by strength, and whose inclination to evil is replaced by an undrivable, unstoppable inclination to good, inclination to greatness, inclination to bring Christ to souls and to fill the world with Christ. And to fill the soul of Christ, this is all not possible without the continual and op operation of our Holy Mother. The Blessed Virgin Mary is not just the greatest of the saints. Not just the physical mother of God. She's not the physical mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God, the mother of God. She's not just the mother of God. She is most necessary for our every life, everyday life. She is truly the mediatrix of all grace that passes through the Old and New Testament. There's no possibility of doing any good thing without her. And hence it was wise that our ancestors called this the feast of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the saints too. There are no saints without her. We are all obliged to become saints. We're all obliged to imitate Christ and to try to establish his kingdom on earth and do our part to make that kingdom grow. This is not possible without Mary. There's no blessed sacrament without Mary. There's no priesthood without Mary. There's no hope of removing sin without Mary. And remember what happened on that day, on March the 25th. All sanctity hinges on that day. The sanctity of every human being that has ever made it to heaven, including Eve, who wept and made it to heaven, and Adam, who wept and made it to heaven. All of them made it to heaven hinged on one moment in history, when at the age of 15, the Blessed Virgin Mary was there in her house at Nazareth. 
And the angel Gabriel came and said, Wilt thou be the mother of God? How could this be since I do not know men? And he proved the presence. And then she said one word. One word which conquers Satan. One word which makes saints. One word which built Christendom and all the churches and built all the armies of Christendom. One word that wiped out all the enemies of God and crushes the head of the serpent. And that is, she said, fiat. Fiat. It made her the queen of the angels when she said that word. St. Thomas says when she said that word, she got the angels in heaven. Not only do we go to heaven without her with her, and without her we can't go to heaven. The same true of St. Michael. Where did Michael get his heart in heaven to be able to say, who is life unto God? Where did he get his strength to say that? What gave him the courage to stand up against the great Lucifer, the highest of all the angels? What made him gave him the strength and boldness to stand up when there were billions of angels ahead of him, waiting for a higher angel to do something? But one of the lowest angels simply said, Who is like unto God? What gave him the strength to say that? It was Mary. When she said, Fiat, let it be done. Every good act is done. Because of her speaking that sacred word. And the angels, when they heard that word, they said, that's what Michael should have said. He did not know the answer. He didn't know what to say. But he knew that there was no one like unto God. He didn't know what to say when Lucifer said, how can God become man? Explain to me why. Explain to me how. What's the answer? Let it be done. That's the answer. And so this is what sanctity is. Let it be done. It is not for us to ask all the foolish questions, but rather, let it be done. Are they speaking error? What must we do with the truth? It must be done. It must be spoken. The truth must be spoken. The error must be condemned. If all men have wandered away from God, as in the days of Tobias, what must be done? What is God's commandment? Let it be done. Go to, his, go to Jerusalem and there worship in the temple. Bury the dead. Rise from the table and leave the food and go to get the go, go to get the, the dead bodies and bring them in. Whatever is the inspiration of God, let it be done. Let them argue about all their theological reasons why it shouldn't be done. Let them make all their excuses. Let the enemies believe that his will cannot be accomplished. But what is the answer to the inspirations of God? It is fiat. When she spoke that fiat at the age of 15... All of hell was conquered and destroyed. All of heaven knelt down before her. And the angels then understood. They understood that she is the queen. She's not just the queen of the men. She's the queen of all the angels. And the angels are in heaven now before God because of her. And all the saints are in before God because of her. And if she did not give the right answer, all of us must be damned. So what is a saint? All a saint is is an appendage of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Something that holds on to her. All a saint is is someone that loves her. All a saint is someone that is a child of her. All a saint is someone that is touched by her. That's all a saint is. There is nothing great about any of the saints. No matter how great they are, from whence came their strength to stand up against the great and wicked emperors? From whence came their wisdom to conquer all of the lies of the enemies of God? They came from her who swept the floor for her son. Came from her that cooked dinner. Came from her that walked into the city of Jerusalem. And this is where it came from. Her wiping the, sweeping the floor was greater than the saints in all of their greatest activities and all that we have is a little bit of an overflow of her heart. A little bit of an overflow of her wisdom. A little bit of an overflow of her gifts and her great virtues, which are without number and cover all the aspects of life. She is the example of all the married. She is an example of all the children. And she is an example of all the priests. And she is an example of all the religious of every type. And she is the enemy of Satan in every one of those categories. And she destroys only by her fiat. She destroys only by lifting her foot and putting it upon the head of the serpent. And there is no way for there to be peace in this world or happiness without her. And now we're in the great and final fight. And what is the final fight? 
Christ. Christ being in our world as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ being in our hearts is the only answer to all the troubles. And where is Christ? He's in the tabernacle. And what is the tabernacle? It's the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And hence it is true. There is a certain truth in the statement that the, that the devil is trying to destroy motherhood. He hates motherhood. He cannot stand motherhood. Because it is motherhood that destroys the kingdom of Satan. And then Satan hates motherhood. He wants to wipe out motherhood. He has made a special effort in the last 150, 200 years to destroy the woman. When a woman becomes a saint, when she becomes a mother, when she is nothing but mother, the whole world becomes greater. The whole world becomes better. And Satan is defeated. The devil is terrified of the mother. Terrified. And we need more mothers. We need more mothers. And the greatest mother is the one that imitates the Blessed Virgin Mary by becoming a mother of all the church and a mother of all souls by giving up her life to be a religious, giving her life to enter into a convent or to a monastery. This is the greatest motherhood. But without motherhood, there's no hope for any of us. We all blame Eve because if she didn't eat that forbidden fruit, if she didn't give it to Adam, then we would not have the original sin to deal with. But just as it says in the great psalm of the Exultet that we sing every Holy Saturday, that, oh, oh, Felix culpa, oh, happy folk. That's what the great my wise monk said when he wrote those words over a thousand years ago. Oh, happy fault. Oh, glorious fault of Adam. Oh, certainly necessary sin of Adam. Oh, certainly necessary sin of Adam, which brought about us such a wonderful Redeemer. Where is the wonder seen in us? The wonder is seen most especially in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the greatest of all men, but he is God and man. But she is only human. She is the greatest of all the pure human beings. Of all the pure creatures of God. He made gazillions of creatures. But the greatest of all those creatures, the most wonderful of them all, is the mother of God. And there isn't any hope for any of us without her. But with her, there's nothing to be feared. With her, there's no danger. With her, there's no problem. And it's foolish for us to fear our enemies if she is our mother. We still do because of our own foolishness. But let's beg the grace to not be fools anymore and to love our Holy Mother who is the only saint and the only cause of sanctity and just stay attached to her and all Satan and all his foolishness will be destroyed. Amen.